Hi there, and welcome back to the Dutch Podcast. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Smeaton, and on this podcast, we dive into the vast and ever-evolving world of hormones as part of our lifelong pursuit of better health. Here at Dutch, we've dedicated over a decade to transforming lives by addressing hormonal imbalances like cycle irregularities, perimenopause, menopause, and more. Our mission is clear, to simplify and advance hormonal health for everyone. On this podcast, I get to bring you cutting edge insights from our top experts on hormone therapy, menopause, personalized medicine, and more. We're all aimed at making a real difference in your well-being. Your questions and feedback are crucial. They shape our discussions and help us navigate the complexities of hormone health together. Now, as always, please remember the content of this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only, should not be considered medical advice. Be sure to consult your healthcare provider for medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment. Today, I'm excited to have Dr. Kara Fitzgerald join us on the Dutch podcast to discuss recent developments in the world of epigenetics and how we can all strive to live longer, healthier, and happier lives. Now, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald is a doctor of naturopathic medicine, and she started specializing in epigenetics and longevity. She really was groundbreaking when conducting a clinical study, which was published in April of 2021 in the journal Aging, which demonstrated potential bioage reversing effects of an eight-week DNA methylation supportive program in middle-aged men. She then repeated a similar study in women, which was published in March 2023. Now, this is really groundbreaking and so exciting to see Dr. Fitzgerald put it out. It showed that just an eight-week diet and lifestyle intervention could reduce or reverse biological aging by about three years. We're going to talk all about that today. Uh, Dr. Kara is an IFM certified practitioner, a faculty member at IFM, and she leads the podcast New Frontiers in Functional Medicine. She's been recognized for her contributions in the field and received a lot of rewards for her work on DNA methylation and functional longevity, and I'm thrilled to have her here today on the podcast. Well, it's nice to have you back, Dr. Fitzgerald, on the Dutch Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Absolutely. It's always good to be with the amazing Dutch team. <laughs> and of course, we have so on. much fun. Yeah. So I'm excited today to talk about like really your bread and butter and your passion and the thing that really lights you up, which is kind of the connection between epigenetics and longevity. Now, how did you end up stumbling into this area of interest and, and really igniting your passion for it? Yeah, um, I, I I love talking about that question because it came in a really kind of a roundabout fashion. I mean, we were, it was around 2013, 2014 when I really started pondering and diving into the literature around epigenetics. It was just, you know, crossing my desk, <laughs> dropping into my email a lot. And um, I noticed a little resistance to really wanting to get into it. It's, it's, it's dense science. There's a joke that says, you know, if you don't understand it, just tell them it's epigenetics. You know, it was, just, it's, 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 and I actually use that, that in my slides for a long time. It's dense, but, um, but it's just, it felt really important to read and think and swim in the pond of the science of epigenetics through a functional slash system slash, you know, naturopathic lens. Um, so I'll just define that first and I'll continue with my story. So epigenetics is everything above the gene, you know, everything that's regulating what gene is on and what gene is, up, is, is, is off, you know, it, and there's, and there are, you know, hundreds of different biochemical marks that can influence the activity of, of, of gene expression. And it's that it, it's an extraordinary conversation in and of itself, just thinking about that. Um, but when we, when I first dove into it, a lot of the science was around um, epigenetics and cancer. So cancer very efficiently taking over gene expression from the host and, you know, turning genes off to promote cancer growth, cancer's growth and, um, excuse me, turning genes on to promote cancer's growth and turning genes off that inhibit cancer. Uh, and that really stopped me in my tracks around, could anything that we're doing in functional medicine be influencing gene expression through the window of epigenetics? And at the time, um, and, you know, and still the area, the, the, the epigenetic mark that is kind of most, most reliable, like the, we have the best labs around it. So the most research is published on it is something called DNA, DNA methylation. 
Um, when there are a lot of methyl groups on the promoter region of a gene, um, it basically blocks that gene from being transcribed. Uh, conversely, when there are few or no uh, methyl groups on a promoter region, that gene can be turned on. Um, and we have enzymes to maintain methylation. We have enzymes to remove methylation, you know, or, you know, add methylation, you know, de novo, new. Uh, so thinking about cancer was our first entry. My dear friend and colleague, Romilly Hodges, is the director of our nutrition programs, or she was then. Now she's doing other work in our practice. And she and I were talking a lot about this during those early years. And decided that we could design a program, a diet and lifestyle program with an eye towards optimizing uh, epigenetic expression, specifically DNA methylation. Um, kind of, you know, sort of, it's, it's funny to think about it in hindsight, sort of, you know, it's somewhat cocky, I don't know, thought that we could just get in there and really build sort of forkful by forkful, activity by activity, you know, something designed to really sweet talk DNA methylation. Um, but we thought that that would be the, you know, the best and perhaps safest way to uh, support, you know, optimal gene expression. So we did, we created a diet and lifestyle program. We started to use it in practice. Um, you know, it's a well-designed dietary pattern really by any measure. It's, you know, it's low glycemic, it's anti-inflammatory. Um, it's a little bit keto leaning, et cetera. It's a healthy dietary pattern. Um, and then we layered in exercise, you know, stress management through meditation and just kind of built this program based on our read on the literature. We are, the question after that, as we started to use it in practice became, are we actually moving the needle on epigenetics? And at that time you couldn't just send somebody out to quest lab, you know, to look at right. gene expression in that way. And so it was, you know, it was really a, a cool, uh, gift that um, Metagenics sponsored, you know, uh, a, a study, for, you know, they actually gave us an unrestricted grant. So that means we were able to design it that, you know, the content that what we did is ours, and we were able to conduct a, you know, a randomized controlled clinical trial on on looking at gene expression in, in, a, in a healthy population. Um, so our first entry into it was really thinking about, you know, cancer and the other chronic diseases of aging, less so than aging. And the reason was that epigenetic age or the, epi the era of the epigenetic clocks was only starting. And especially mm. the idea that we could move the clock, that we could favorably augment you know, biological age or epigenetic age is measured by one of these clocks. I mean, that just simply hadn't been done in humans at the time of our, our of our first blush on this. Um, so I was pretty confident that we were going to influence gene expression. And again, I, I look back and maybe chuckle a little. It seemed kind of cocky, but it just, you know, our read on the literature and a lot of the literature back then was in vitro and cell studies, but still it was you know, we just designed it through the best lens that we had and our best read on the literature. But anyway, we got this grant. I want to stop you, though. It's not yeah. cocky. This is the scientific process. It's you see what's out there, never been done in humans, and you create a scientific hypothesis. So please accept that reframe because I don't think it's cocky <laughs> at all. I think it's amazing. It's pretty. I mean, it really is. It is. It's, it is incredible. And yeah, you know, perhaps that's not the right word for it. But it's just it's it's funny to look back on it and see where where we are now, mm. you know, some years later. So in 2016, we released a white paper on it. We called it the methylation diet and life, lifestyle. We, we had clinical data that we could lower homocysteine with it. We could see people clinically respond and, and, and have, you know, improved uh, symptom control, et cetera. Homocysteine, which was our surrogate marker of methylation, you know, homocysteine sits right there in the center of the methylation cycle. Um, we could see that drop in people who really stuck to the program. So we had some hint that, you know, it was doing something. We could see cholesterol drop, you know, and so on and so forth, inflammatory markers. So we were getting that information from clinical practice. But we embarked on this study. Um, we launched it in 2018. You know, again, knowing we were going to have the tools to look at the clocks or the clock, it was a single clock at the time, uh, but really not ex holding my breath that we would see any movement on it. But during the course of our study, even though it was an eight-week intervention, it took us over a year to recruit healthy 
um, a healthy cohort because we wanted to look at middle-aged men um, who were healthy at baseline and that and it took a while to get that to get that group. And the reason that we chose that group is that we wanted to try to capture the aging phenomena not influenced by chronic diseases. Mm, um, so, and it sense. just, it took, yeah, it took some time and, you know, middle-aged being, uh, 50 to 70, if we had women and this is a pilot study. So we had 40 people in total, 20 and 20. If we had included women in this cohort, the waters would have been muddied by, um, the range of pre menopause to post menopause. And we would have, we'd struggle with teasing through the hormone influence in such a small cohort. We did come back later and we can talk about it. And we released a little group, a group of case studies, a, a collection of, of case reports in women. Um, and hopefully we'll get to, you know, just research a larger cohort and include both sexes and, you know, a broader study population. But anyway, that's what we set out to do. It took a while to do. Uh, and during the, start, the time our, our study was running, the first paper was released to show um, biological age reversal as measured by clock, the epigenetic clocks um, in humans. And this was the father of the epigenetic clock, Steve Horvath, and Greg Fay was the uh, first author on the paper, the principal investigator there. Um, so those guys together released a year a, a paper on a year long intervention um, with growth hormone and a handful of other things in a group of nine men, and they showed a biological age reversal um, of over two and a half years at the end of that study. And it was it was ridiculously exciting, you know. So it was very 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 exciting. Like anybody who was paying attention to this field, you know, it was the first. It really, really was cool to see that that had happened. And it, and it made us excited about knowing we were going to be able to look at the clocks. But, you know, again, we're talking about an eight week diet and lifestyle intervention, not a year long intervention using, you know, growth hormone injections among, you know, among other um, treatments. So anyway, we, we moved through the, the um, duration of the of the study and then started to crunch our data. And, um, you know, again, just, you know, it took our breath away, you know, when we saw that we had um, slowed biological age as measured by the Horvath, the first generation clock. There's many clocks now um, in our study group as compared to, to the control group by over three years. I mean, it was just extraordinary. And then we could actually see the within group. So, our study group at baseline as compared to follow up um, also got, you know, significantly younger. So yeah, it was, it was a big deal. <laughs> it's a huge deal. I mean, just to reiterate for listeners, this is an eight week intervention, really like non-pharmaceutical. And that's what I think is so great. And if you want to read more about the study and about the work, Dr. Fitzgerald has a book called Younger You. We'll link to it in the show notes. I actually use this all the time and I give it to my patients for fertility because yes. fertility is one of the earliest signs we have of aging in the body. And I have found that so much of the work that you've done is very relevant to couples that are trying to conceive, especially if they're like over 35, really. That's a huge, it has big implications for fertility. So that's like my manual for them as far as what to do, awesome. diet and lifestyle. So I'm, but I awesome. would recommend taking a look at it. And so let's talk just briefly about the intervention, because this is an eight week yeah. intervention. Like you said, it's not a long term yeah. study. And to yeah. have three years biological age or not biological. Yeah. Biological age reversal after an eight week intervention. I was truly shocked. I mean, I'm <laughs> sure you were too, but that's more than I would have expected because I would anticipate that you could get results like that, but that it would take longer to achieve results like that. Well, yeah, that's right. I, um, first of all, let me just, I just have to say on the fertility work that you're doing, I'm thrilled. I did not know, I didn't realize you were using our intervention in your practice. And we talk about, I talked about fertility in the book and preconception planning and all of that, and even tweaked the macros a bit. Um, because it is your apps, your, it's the most important time where you really want gene expression to be, you know, mm -hmm. happening, you know, as perfectly as it possibly can. So gosh, thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. Um, okay. So yeah, the intervention, um, it's so I, 
it, it, first of all, I think what we're starting to see. So let me just say this was the first of its kind study. And we did get a lot of attention because of that. Um, it was the in, conducted in humans, the first randomized control study using a, a, you know, a diet and lifestyle intervention and looking at gene expression and, you know, and looking at the, the epigenetic clocks. Um, since then, more and more studies have come out you know, using diet and, and lifestyle interventions in humans and looking at epigenetics. It's, it's just extraordinary. It's so exciting to, you know, be right in the middle of basically the, you know, a, the birth of a new science. It's extraordinarily exciting. I think that the take home is, um, and I should circle back and nuance the conversation around the clocks because the clocks have evolved and and some scientists would argue that we need to go back and do our intervention using the newer clocks um and we want we will absolutely i want to do that more than anything and use we used saliva in our original specimen now we see that we should have you know used blood as our specimen but we didn't know that at the time we were working with the best knowledge you know we started building this and mm -hmm. designing the study in 2017 um so we so there are things that have changed and i and it would be fabulous to put our intervention to the test um you know under the modern abilities <laughs> the abilities that have changed right. over a handful of years it's extraordinary but the idea is that you know environment uh, is influencing gene expression all of the time. And a huge aha for me was that every single nutrient on a fork can be an epinutrient, you know, can be uh, sweet talking DNA, you know, sweet talking gene expression. And we could build brick by brick, you know, using our best read on the literature, you know, what we think that optimal forkful would look like. And so you're so everything you're ingesting is a complex interplay of compounds, some yet to be identified. There's this whole field called, you know, nutrition arm called the, you know, dark matter, which you know, is yet to be defined. Def even defined, but we know, um, you know, the polyphenols, the, the various phytochemicals, the, the vitamins and the minerals, all of this, they're interacting with each other. They're acting, um, they're being uh, uh, acted upon by our microbiome, by our digestive juices, by our stress status at the time. There's so much complex interaction Um for the whole journey and then once absorbed is just potent regulator of gene expression. And I really, really came to appreciate the power of that. And then when you layer onto that exercise, these, you know, exercise is an epinutrient. <laughs> it is. When you look at gene expression, you can see what exercise is doing looks like, you know, a really fabulously designed meal in some ways. You know, it's, it's really, it's rather remarkable. Uh, sleep similarly has these favorable kind of sweet talking effects on the epigenome uh, and stress reduction, sort of taking care of balance, you know, experiencing a balance, balanced amount of, of, of stress rather than, you know, stress kind of running our show. All of these things influence gene expression in, you know, in extraordinary ways. And so it makes sense to me that we would have the ability to, you know, change things uh, in a strong way. So my, you know, our original hunch really kind of bore fruit in our intervention. Well, of course, it, I mean, it completely makes sense to me because we're not random victims of disease, right? There's a process biologically that happens and we are part of an ecosystem and community of all the things that we're exposed to and our bodies constantly and very brilliantly adapting to our environment, right? So I love how you word that. It's like every fork, every bite of me of food becomes either helpful or harmful. And it allows you to really change the way that you look at your food. And I love your social media feed because people take pictures of their food and like tell you all those epi epinutrients that they're eating so they can get a pat on the back that they had beets today or whatever that food is that they're talking about. Um, and so and it's really wonderful because I think it changes the perspective of food from being something that you blindly do because you're hungry and you need to eat 
to something that's a lot more intentional and thoughtful. Yeah. That's about nourishment. And by design, we didn't want to keep include vitamins in the me- intervention. Not that I don't prescribe them in practice, not that I don't use them all the time and, you know, and take them myself uh, and have, you know, prescribed to my family and so forth. So I'm not anti-vitamin by a long shot, um, but we really wanted a food forward approach. And, you know, probably, of course, you know, because you've read the book that I'm a huge fan of liver. I don't cook it very well. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat any liver that I cook to truth be told, but you can get liver caps now. And and so I'm a huge fan of liver. Caps. If you can cook liver, if you can make yourself a nice pate, go for it. It's awesome. But liver is a multivitamin mineral complex in a food matrix. And so that's what I'm getting at here. This food matrix, this extraordinary complex interplay of compounds that we evolved to be exposed to our microbiome evolved to have this information and then, and then, you know, modify it and create these really sophisticated, sophisticated, extraordinary postbiotic com- um, compounds. So we just evolved with this kind of information versus isolated bioidentical compounds and superphysiologic amounts. And le- really leaning into that and, and testing that, you know, plus the lifestyle components, may- not only made the most sense, but just really seemed the correct way to go. hmm so I want to step it back and for maybe listeners who are newer to this concept, can you help us understand the difference between chronological age and biological age? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. So chronological age is the number of birthdays we've celebrated and we can't do anything about that. <laughs> Try as me might. My sister has been 29 at her birthday for the last, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> 20 years. Um, uh we, so chronological age, we can't change, but biological age is the rate of physical aging. So basically the, the, the wear and tear on the body. And we can do, you know, by our biological age can be trending in step with our chronological age. It can be faster than our chronological age, or it can be slower than our chronological age. There's kind of a cool paper that came out, I want to say maybe 2015 or uh, thereabouts, um, the group that created one of the cool, actually a third generation biological age clock published this earlier, where they lo- they asked individuals to, um, you know, look at, at, a, at a handful of photographs of faces and to um, determine age. And we, we, they, what they discovered is that we're basically hardwired to see when somebody's aging faster. So, mm. so to the, so the, the, the point is that when people look older, they probably are biologically extraordinarily enough. And, you know, and for, evolutionarily, perhaps we're hardwired to see that because we want to stay with the healthiest in the pack. Um, so some of us are indeed aging faster and we can see that reflected um, in their, you know, in their appearance or in their body habits and how they move, et cetera, et cetera. And some of us are aging slower and the extraordinary science of, um, you know, that we're, we're onto now, uh, headlong onto is being able to measure this rate of biological aging, uh, using a variety of tools and the tools, it's just an extraordinarily active uh, area of science right now. It's really, really exciting. At the forefront are the tools using epigenetics and specifically DNA methylation. So there's a lot of epigenetic clocks these days, you know, capturing the rate of aging through a variety of parameters. So now, what you know, are those typically measure? They measure like how much methylation is happening in those promoter regions or... Can you, I mean, this might be getting in over our heads. I might have asked a question that's taking a little bit too deep, but at a high level. Yeah. So they are looking at, it's no, it's beyond specifically, ju- they're, they're not just limiting their investigation to promoter region methylation. There's about, I think at last count, something like 30 million methylation sites on the DNA. There's a lot. And so they can identify either sites of methylation or, you know, an absence of, so sites of methyl groups or absence of methyl groups in certain regions of the DNA um, that correlate with um, chronological age, with, with um, health, with disease status, with, you know, smoking history. I mean, they, they, they can, 
they can capture DNA methylation imprints around a variety of parameters and then create a clock based on you know, those methylation imprints that they've found and then test them across um, different age ranges, uh, you know, different um, ethnicities and so forth, different, uh, you know, gender cohorts and just massively kick the tires of these patterns to see whether they are, you know, reproducible and effective. And so to this, to that end, uh, we've created, there's quite a few, you know, clocks that have been created using, you know, variations of this. Um, And these clocks can predict morbidity and mortality uh, more reliably than chronological age alone. So one of the things that's so fascinating about lifespan is like women generally have a better, a longer lifespan than men slightly. Now it's the gaps closing, but you know, one of the things that I know from you is that women don't actually have a longer health span. And sometimes that looks like women being sicker for longer rather than being healthier for longer. It's such a bummer. I know. I remember, you know, when I first learned those stats many years ago that women outlived men, it was Oh, that's kind of a cool fact. But <laughs> I, no, I know we cheer ourselves actually, up with right, that first. Right? But... Oh, we, we're going to live long. You know, but yeah, but when you tease through those data, you just basically see that women are sick longer. You know, women women have a longer sick span is what that It's like obesity, diabetes, pain, yeah. you know, joint pain, yeah. autoimmune Cancer. disease. Cancer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cardiovascular disease. I mean, and a lot of this, like just, you know, because we're, this is, you know, Dutch is sponsoring this podcast. I mean, we can trace a lot of this back to actually bone density comes out, you know, is, is, is mm-hmm. to, to the massive changes that our hormones go through, the radical changes that our hormones go through. So, you know, and this, in the drop in our hormones, when we hit um, perimenopause men- and menopause, go through all of those changes, you know, that really drives the chronic disease picture in us in a, in a huge way. And I do think uh, it's important to be paying attention to our hormones. And this is one of the reasons I love that we're talking about this because like hip fracture is a leading cause of death in females. Yeah. And once hip fracture yeah. occurs, you know, it's not the initial fall. It's like all the sequelae yeah. that come from yeah. not being mobile afterward. And and yes. it's something that we really need to be considering because there yes. are hormonal implications that are pretty easy to prevent when it comes to like identifying women who are at risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis and considering yes. all the therapies that are within our toolkit as physicians, but, you know, I think estradiol therapy, estrogen, yeah. you know, menopausal hormone therapy can be such a great lower risk intervention there. And when we talk about yes. health span, that's not one that's modifying epigenetics. Although when you think about hormone therapies, they absolutely are. So yeah, it is. It maybe is. That's it not is. a true it, statement. It, right. Well, it's just yeah, a matter but, of, you know, we need time. to be adjusting, addressing it from all around. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's just a matter of time before we really just have the data on how it influences epigenetics. I mean, we definitely know that menopause accelerates epi- at biological age as measured through epigenetics. So we know that's happening, and you know, it'll be it, it, it won't be long before we can see whether the use of HRT is really beneficial in a large population mm. of women, and especially, you know, the use of, of bioidentical HRT and the ways that we're doing it now, which is infinitely safer because we can look at things like, um, you know, for hydroxy estrone and whether we're able to methylate it. And, you know, we're able to get so much more information on the various uh, compounds we're looking at and how well and safely we're utilizing these all important hormones and how much we have of them. That's it's fascinating. There's so much cool work being done in this area. Now, you'd mentioned some of the things that slow biological aging. You'd mentioned sleep, you'd mentioned food, you'd mentioned movement. Are there other things that are well, I'm sure some well, there are vitamins that have been tested that affect methylation or like ter- sure. curcumin and turmeric, for example. There's like so many downstream inflammatory changes. And when you combine that with methyl donors, you can get a lot of benefit. Um, but what other interventions? really move the needle in your experience? So there's actually a a paper that just, that just came out. It's actually, it's a preprint. It still has to go through peer review, looking at 51 different interventions uh, and their ability, 
the, the ability to impact. Very cool. Um, yeah. Um, but it needs to be interpreted with some nuance. So we know that if you investigate a population with a certain um, condition, so if you, if you, if some, if there's a chron- chronic diseases accelerate biological age. So, and really well established is, is diabetics. So if you study a diabetic um cohort and you're able to control blood sugar, uh, you know, and lower A1C, et cetera, through, you know, using metformin or, or, or diet and lifestyle interventions, you should be able to see at the end, you know, an improvement in their, uh, biological age for sure. Um, so depending on cohort, I know one of the most responsive was a group of, uh, HIV, individuals with HIV. And so they saw a pretty profound biological uh, reversal with biological age reversal with their um, drug intervention. However, mm-hmm. you know, in healthy cohorts, I think we're still teasing it out. Um, diet has been shown beneficial. Uh, caloric restriction has been shown beneficial. You know, exercise has been shown beneficial. Um, I think there's some caveats around that. I mean, there's there's a push in the scientific community to move into using these next generation clocks. So um, I think rapamycin has been shown to uh, beneficially move the needle on clocks. Um vitamin D. So vitamin D deficiency has been demonstrated Mm. in a handful of publications to actually accelerate biological aging and then treating with vitamin D uh, has shown, you know, a beneficial influence on biological aging. I would, I think the dasatinib quercetin intervention has shown, you know, showed benefit in bioage. There's a lot, a lot of options to choose from. Yeah. There, yeah, there is, and the literature keeps growing. And I'm, I, you know, I apologize because I'm working from this this preprint that um, that just was released. So, uh, but yeah, there's a slew of, there's a slew of literature, and more is coming out all the time. Um, it's yeah. How? What about? I mean, how can practitioners choose the best things for their patients? I mean, it seems as though the lifestyle interventions are a no brainer to implement. Beyond that. Are there better ways to determine what might be most helpful for someone? That's a great question. So I would say that, um, it's, you know, now that I've done this research, I'm attracting a group, uh, you know, my patient population now I would describe as sort of biohacking leaning. It wasn't always, I had sort of a, I had a kind of a workhorse functional medicine practice for many, many, many years, but now I'm getting more biohackers and they're coming to me on all of the kind of sexy you know, vitamins and minerals and, and, you know, accessory nutrients and practicing high intensity interval training and, you know, rucksacking and all of this other stuff, uh, you know, uh, cryotherapy or, you know, cold immersion, et cetera, et cetera. And that's awesome. And it's great. And I do think that there's, there's science around, around all of these to varying degrees to engage in, but we always need to treat the individual first. So Hmm. this does not supplant using a good functional medicine lens, you know, taking a good history and getting whoever that human being is sitting in front of us onto their optimal uh, diet and lifestyle pattern and to, and, you know, optimizing their nutrient levels, using exactly what they need, stepping outside of the literature, the literature, social media, it's super sexy and engaging. And a lot of people really want to take the latest thing getting, you know, that, that influencers are talking about, but we really want to just get into balance ourselves. So do we have profound allergies? You know, that's an inflammatory burden. That's what, that's a pro aging phenomena. So if you've had these profound allergies that you haven't rectified yet, um, or if you've got a mercury burden, because you're eating a ton of fish, you know, you can have a whole, you know, or you've got some degree of uh, 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 inflammatory bowel disease, actually, you know, IBS, or let's say just whatever our collection of imbalances, and it can be the continuum up to inflammatory bowel disease. But if we're not addressing those and, but, and trying to layer in these longevity interventions, we're really not going to see uh, extraordinary turnaround. So we need to deal with our own reality first. And then from there, layer on these, um, these additional interventions or layer on some of them concurrently. Mm. 
there, the clock that we're using now that we're really pretty excited about is called the pace of aging. And this doesn't give us a chronological age or excuse me, it doesn't give us a biological age. So if you're 40, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to say that you're younger or older than 40. It gives you the rate of what you're, how you're aging in that moment. And so a rate of one is consistent with chronological age. Greater than one is accelerated rate. Less than one is a, is a, is a, a decelerated rate. And so we obviously want to be less than one. And that's a pretty fast, responsive clock. Mm. So you could get that at baseline and then you can track it with your functional medicine interventions and then with the long longevity interventions and you can get it pretty regularly. Um, we can link to a spreadsheet that we use uh, that's standard chemistry biomarkers. Anybody can input their data, any clinician ordering you know, standard chemistries can use this. And this will also give you a biological age. And it, one of the clocks, one of the called the pheno age clock was based on this particular calculator. Uh, and so that's available and you can, and that's super cheap um, relative to buying a DNA methylation clock. So there's, yeah. So there's it makes it really tool. accessible. Like any patient that's doing blood work can even conventionally could yeah. get access to this type of information. That's awesome. Super, super easy. And so then you can start to, you know, track how you're responding, you know, be your own N of one and see what interventions work for you. There's a lot of individualization that needs to happen for mm -hmm. sure. Not everybody should be on metformin. Not everybody should be on rapamycin. Not everybody should be, you know, eating one meal a day, et cetera, et cetera. As we, as we right. all, we know this in naturopathic slash functional medicine and, you know, it's absolutely true. And so if we follow our own rate of aging, we can design an intervention optimal for us. And, and actually, it, let me just say, in our practice, so before we started to research our, our intervention in our clinical practice, we do take the tenants of the Younger You program and individualize them for the human sitting in front of us so that every forkful of epinutrients is, you know, is de rigueur for all of our patients. But the design, the ratio of what epinutrients are on that fork will change from person to person. That's awesome. Um, and, but one of the things you said before around like social media, there obviously there's a lot of talk around lifespan and health span and healthy aging. And we absolutely see all of the trends, you know, the intermittent fasting, the sauna, the cold plunges. And what I really like about what you said is, you know, you have all of these things that could potentially add benefit that do have science in a lot of cases. And yet you start with the fundamentals when it comes to the Younger You program. And I just want to call that out because I think sometimes, you know, as a society, like if you're going to invest in something for your health, you know, if you're going to get a cold plunge tub for outside of your house, but then you're going to like not sleep enough, be really stressed, party, drink, you know, mm -hmm. or you know, have and not you know, eat really well. refractory, small, you know, small bile bacterial overgrowth that you just haven't, you know, remedied or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's so just, it's, you got to start common. at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Start at the beginning. And then like the cold plunging is like the icing on the cake, but it's not the cake. Right. So I love that, mm -hmm. you know, you have this focus in your program on what's going to move the needle the most for people. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask you about a study that came out earlier this year. Cause I, when I saw this, I thought about you immediately and I'm really excited to get your perspective on it. It was published in Nature, and the study looked at aging, which we've always generally considered to be a linear process. You know, you get one year older every year. But what the study saw, I'm sure you came across this, but that there were a couple of clusters in our lifetime where periods of accelerated aging occurred. So it was 44 and 60 is what they'd seen, where there was almost like these key substantial changes in dysregulation in our different molecular markers, immune regulation, carbohydrate metabolism, all these things seem to kind of like cluster around aging. Do you have any perspective on that or thoughts on that when you saw that study? Um, I think it's really interesting. <laughs> I think it'll be kind of neat if I, I don't, I don't know that I have any relative re revelatory thoughts on it other than, um, <sighs> What are my thoughts? I would say that that's, you know, it's, it was a small cohort, so it needs to, it definitely needs to be substantiated in a larger group and, you know, and, and, um, the study, so the study has some limitations around it that I think have been, you know, fairly critiqued and they should take it. It's a really cool, uh, 
uh, interesting idea. Maybe not cool, but uh, especially if you're 44 or 60. But I am 44. Idea. I'm 44 right funny? now. And I was Isn't like, oh, gosh, yeah. this is great. Great. Uh, but that see, hit hard. That's, well, except that, except <laughs> that this is just, this is looking at, you know, some a population average. So again, you, you absolutely have the power to not be engaging in that, in that way. And, you know, everyone in these studies where they're looking at these, you know, the, the mean, everyone's an out, you know, everybody's basically an outlier. And then they're all, you know, uh, 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 that the, the average at the end of it looks, you know, looks at these two uh, peaks. So I think that it's an interesting uh, first blush at capturing uh, when we might have these leaps for, the forward in aging, and it may uh, direct how we um, how we treat people during these times. Uh, but I think that a lot more research needs to be done in it. Very interesting, but a lot more research needs to be done. And again, I really. I just I stand by that if we're if we're uh, doing the work that we need to be doing, uh, we can really push against being you know as much of a victim to these if these if these two data points actually bear out in larger studies you know we I think we have uh, the possibility of really pushing against being a victim of those. Yeah, um, right. And let me I'll, I'll I'll just say one other thing about this. Um, and we do have a baked in life expectancy uh, that we're starting to, I think these studies and other studies like this, we're starting to tease out what that looks like, how that expresses itself. So we get at best case, humans get to live to 120. And I do think some of the cool science is getting into and touching upon what that looks like and why that is. So maybe this is a piece of that puzzle. Fabulous. And I think the last question I have for you, you know, because we're at the Dutch test and we love hormones, is yeah. how do hormones play a role in biological aging? And is that a consideration for women that they need to be thinking about when it comes to like long term health? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the revelations that has really, the revolutions, revelation that has really come out of this movement towards uh, focusing on, on longevity has been a much needed uh, attention towards women's health and especially around perimenopause, postmenopause, you know, it is especially around our hormones. I mean, and especially sort of rebounding and recovering from the women's health initiative, you know, misinterpretation. Um, no question about it. Hormones play a huge role in not only quality of life, but, you know, in biology, in our, in our rate of aging, we know that, you know, menopause is a massive age accelerant, uh, unfortunately, and that in fact, it may not be appropriate for, uh, women to just simply allow that to occur, you know, without considering mm. HRT. I think there's a place for HRT for a lot of us. Um, I also think we have a good, 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 good toolkit to minimize the symptomology and the problems associated with menopause if, if we're not going to do hormone replacement therapy. But yeah, hormones are incredibly important. Um, you know, maintaining them, supporting robust and appropriate metabolism and, you know, the, just something that any practitioner working in the longevity space or functional medicine space or naturopathic space is, is thinking about and looking at. So yeah, you guys are in the right Fabulous. place. <laughs> Fabulous. Great. Well, I thank you so much for joining me today. It's always fun to talk with you and learn about the work you're, you've done and the work you're doing. And I just always appreciate your perspective, Dr. Fitzgerald. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Nice to be here. If you're wanting to learn and really expand your expertise in hormones, you're not going to want to miss our podcast. So make sure you tune in each and every week for our new content.